21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Wait a minute, who is it? Shot your husband? Where? What's the address? Yeah. Yeah. 45 or 49? Well, where's the gun? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, you stay right there. I'll send the officers right over. Yeah. Right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. The 4 to 12 tour had been exceedingly quiet, due in part to a heavy downpour of rain, which began early in the afternoon and continued until nearly 11. Troublemakers like to get wet no more than anyone else, and a good rain keeps them off the street. By midnight, when I turned out the platoon for the late tour, the sky had turned clear, although the streets of the city were still wet and glistening. After the men had marched out the front door of the station house, I went into my office to dispose of some accumulated paperwork and await the appearance of patrolman Daniel Ritchie. He had requested to see me when he came off the job at midnight in regard to a leave of absence for the purpose of attending to personal business in Florida in connection with his father's estate. At 12.25 a.m., while I was so engaged, Sergeant Waters, who was supervising patrol, instructed his operator, patrolman Elton Tyler, to pull their car to a stop at the curb near a call box on First Avenue, close to the northern boundary of the precinct. Okay. I want to ring in. Yes, sir. Sergeant Waters, box number 11. Let me talk to the lieutenant, will you, Vince? Yeah. Hold on. Okay. 21st Precinct, Lieutenant Dorman. Sergeant Waters, Lieutenant. Yeah? I went up there on First Avenue to take a look at that condition. Yeah? There's about a foot of water in the street at that spot, Lieutenant. Looks like the catch basin in the sewer is stopped up there. Excuse me, officer. And just a second, lady. A woman just walked up and was speaking to me, Lieutenant. Oh. I'll be with you in a minute, lady. Oh. All the water from the rain is just hung up there, Lieutenant. I think it'd be a good idea to notify the borough president's office and have them send a crew up to paint out that catch basin. All right, I'll notify them. Officer. In a second, lady. They ought to get up there as soon as they can, Lieutenant. The traffic's slopping around that water. Okay, I'll notify them right away. Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. What is it? I wanted to tell you I just shot my husband. Yeah? I did. I just shot him. Where is it? In that house there next to the corner. I live in there. Where is he? Upstairs in the flat. All right. Let's go have a look. I couldn't help it. I really couldn't. Uh, just a second. Uh, Tyler. Yes, sir. Come on. Yes, sir. Uh, what did you shoot him with? A gun. I know it must have been a gun. Yes, Sergeant. Come on with us. We've got a shooting. Yes. A what kind of gun? A shotgun, I think you call it. You know, gun about this long. Is he dead? I don't know. I, I did it and I ran out of the house right away. I ran out of the house to get some help. We got no phone, you know. In here? Yes, that's right. Second phone. I'll get the door. Yeah. It's not locked. Didn't take my key. It's not locked. 
Why did you shoot him? I warned him. I warned him, and he still came after me. I warned him to stay away from me. All right. Where is the shotgun? Upstairs. I left it upstairs. When did this happen? Just now, just a minute ago. I came out to call someone, call some help. Must not have been a very loud shotgun. Nobody in the building heard it. It was loud, all right. It was the loudest thing I ever heard. Which apartment up there? In the front. That one? Yeah. Here, I left the door open when I ran out. Whose gun is it? His. All right, go ahead. I wish you'd go first. No, you go in. All right. Well, where is it? In there, in the bedroom. Where's the gun? In there, too. All right. You go sit over there in there. Where? Over there. Sit down on the couch if you want. All right. I, I think I ought to sit, sit down and... Okay, Tyler. Yes, sir. Use your foot to push it all the way open. Okay, Todd. Brother. Stay there. Keep an eye on her. Yes, sir. He shot him all right, but good. Okay. Double barrel shotgun. We'll leave it later. Yes, sir. Okay. She was kissed. See? See what I mean? Yeah, I see. Go on down and ring in, Tyler. Tell him what we got. Yes, sir. Uh, close that door. Yes, sir. Is he dead? I think so, yeah. Well, I couldn't say I didn't warn him. I've warned him over and over again. That'll be in my favor, won't it, that I, that I warned him? Lady, take my word for it. You'll need a lot more than that in your favor. On instructions of Sergeant Waters, Patrolman Tyler went downstairs to the street and walked to the police call box. From there, he notified Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer of the homicide. Lieutenant Gorman, in turn, immediately informed the 21st Detective Squad and the Manhattan Communications Bureau. He then rang into my office and gave me what information he had obtained. I instructed him to have a car come by the station house to take me to the scene. As I walked out into the muster room, Detectives Novak and McInerney, who were on their way, stopped long enough to tell me that Lieutenant Matt King... The commander of the 21st Squad had been called at his home, as is required in all homicides and all other serious crimes. In the meantime, the Communications Bureau dispatched an ambulance to the scene and notified the Manhattan East Homicide Squad, the New York County District Attorney's Office, the Medical Examiner, the Photographic Bureau of BCI, and, because a firearm was used, the Ballistics Bureau. In addition, six patrolmen from the 21st were sent to control the crowd of curious people who always gather on the sidewalk and to keep back behind their doors other tenants of the building awakened by the excitement. When I arrived and started up the stairs to the second floor, an ambulance attendant from the Beth David Hospital passed me as he was going down. I continued on up. Who's down there, Vaquero? Eisman? Yes, sir, sir. Get a 95 tag out of your car and bring it up here. Hello, Sergeant. What'd you say, Sergeant? Captain. A 95 tag. Get one out of your car and bring it up here. Okay, Sergeant. What'd the ambulance attendant have to say? The O.A., Captain. Mm -hmm. Who's here? Only Novak and McEnany of the 21st Squad so far, Captain. Nobody's got here from the Homicide Squad yet. Uh, want to take a look around? Yeah. Back there. Oh, just a second, Captain. Now, listen, you people. You were told to get inside your places and stay there. Now, get back in there. There's nothing to see here. That's just the way the door was standing open when we came up the stairs. Uh-huh. That's her, sitting on the couch. You want to talk to her, Captain? In a minute. Let's see in there first. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
They've got two kids, you know. Where are they? At a fresh air camp. Girl, ten, the boy, seven. Rough. Yeah. She told me he came home about midnight. Said he was about two thirds drunk. Yeah. She said he started after her, started to beat him. She ran in here, into the bedroom. She closed the door and pushed that chair up against it. She started pounding on it. Told him not to come in. Then she said he started pounding on the door harder. She went to the closet there and got the gun. She warned that if he came in, she was going to shoot him. Finally pushed the chair out from under the door knob and came in. She fired. Fell right there. That's her story. Her aim was sure good. Yes, sir. All right, let's talk to her. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Tyler. Uh, Mrs. Wheel, this is Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. You, uh, want to tell me how this happened, Mrs. Wheel? I told him how it happened. The sergeant here, and the detectives asked me, I told them how it happened. I don't feel like telling it anymore. You're going to have to tell it a lot more times, Mrs. Wheel. What's your first name, Mrs. Wheel? Eva. Uh-huh. How do you spell the last name? W-E-A-L-D. Your husband's name is Joe? Yes, that's right. I understand you have two children. Yes, Margaret and Joseph Jr. How old are they? She's ten, the boy's seven. Where are they? They left Monday for a fresh air camp. They've been going for two years now. Two weeks in the country. It's nice. Does them a lot of good. What happens tonight? Well, he was out drinking. He's an electrician. Gets off work 4.30 in the afternoon. He didn't show up for supper and didn't show up all night. Mm. Came home about 11.30, quarter to 12, something like that. All I asked him was where he was. Mm-hmm. I just pushed me to his home. I said, well, Joe, I'm not going to stand being pushed around anymore. So I fought back a little bit. I said, he stopped him. He pushed me around some more. So I ran in there in the bedroom. Closed the door and I put the chair behind it. And he started hitting on the door and I yelled to him. I, I yelled, Joe, you're not going to touch me. You're not going to put your hands on me. He said he was going to kill me. So I went to the closet and got out the shotgun and I said to him, I yelled to the door. I yelled, Joe, if you come in here, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to shoot you. So he did. And I did. How did you learn to shoot? Oh, I knew he showed me. He always wanted to take me duck hunting. He always wanted me to go with him, but I never did. He just showed me how to use the gun. Was that the first time you ever fired it? Yes, that was the first time. Listen, what what can they do to me, do you know? I've got two kids to take care of. Can you tell me what they're going to do to me? Well, we don't decide that, Mrs. Weald. We just find out what happened and report it to the district attorney. He takes it up with the court. We have nothing to say about what they do with you. Oh. He, he would have killed me if I, I, I didn't do it. You, you don't know him. He got wild, really wild all the time. You can ask anybody, anybody in the building here. They'll tell you. Yes, well, we'll find out all oh. about it. What? Uh, his mother. Who, who's going to tell her? I don't want to do it. I don't want that job. Where does she live? A couple of blocks from here. That's all on York Avenue. What's her name? Mrs. Wheel, too. Isabel Wheel. Who's going to tell her? Will somebody from the police department do it? Yes. Somebody from the police department will do it. That's good. I wouldn't have nerve to face her. You had the nerve to shoot her son. I know. But that's different. Now, back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Within a few minutes, two detectives from the Manhattan East Homicide Squad and a photographer arrived. Pictures of the body and the surrounding conditions were made from every possible angle. Lieutenant King, the ranking officer of the detective division on the job, began to dictate to a stenographer from the homicide squad an accurate description of the body, its position in the room, and all other physical details that might later be needed as evidence before the grand jury or in court. A deputy medical examiner appeared, and while he was making his examination of the body... A detective from the Ballistics Bureau arrived to take custody of the shotgun used in the homicide. The deputy medical examiner made a preliminary report that death was due, apparently, to a shotgun charge in the chest and ordered the body taken to Bellevue for an autopsy. While awaiting the arrival of the morgue wagon, a detective took fingerprints of the deceased. 
And finally, Patrolman Elton Tyler, the first officer on the scene, made a search of the body, removed all property except clothing, and placed a UF-95 identification tag around the wrist. The body was then removed to the morgue. Meanwhile, detectives of the 21st Squad and the Homicide Squad began the investigation by questioning Mrs. Weald and some of her neighbors. At ten minutes past two in the morning, when all that could be accomplished at the scene of the homicide was done, Lieutenant King ordered Mrs. Weald taken to the station house. As Patrolman Tyler, the arresting officer, and Detective Novak accompanied her to the 21st Squad office on the second floor, Lieutenant King leaned against the filing cabinet and watched them enter. Over here, Mrs. Wheeler. Where? Oh, over here. Do you want me? Yes, that's right. Hello, Tyler. Hello, Lieutenant. We met over at your place, I'm Lieutenant King. Yes, um... Come into my office, please. Novak, Mac, let's go. Yes, sir. Tyler. Yes, sir. Inside, Mrs. Wilson. Just have a seat right there. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Shut the door, Tyler. Yes. Mrs. Wheel, you know you're in serious trouble. I don't care. I really don't care. There are a few things I'd like to get straight. I told you everything I remember. Mrs. Wheel, I'm interested to know how your husband could chase you around the house, threaten to beat you up, threaten to kill you, throw furniture at you, pound on the door... I'd like to know how he could do all these things and be so quiet about it. None of your neighbors on either side of you or upstairs or downstairs heard a thing. How do you account for that? I don't know how to account for it. So all that racket he was making, chasing you around, threatening you. Seems probable that someone should have heard it, doesn't it? Well, when I fired the shotgun, that made a lot of noise. Nobody heard that either. Mm. They didn't, did they? You didn't find anybody heard that? I'd like you to tell me something else. Yes? When this officer here came up the stairs... When he came up with Sergeant Waters, the door to the bedroom was closed almost all the way. Isn't that right, Tyler? Yes, sir, Lieutenant, that's right. The sergeant had me use my foot to open it the rest of the way. He didn't want me to touch the doorknob. Mrs. Wheel, did you close that door when you came out of the bedroom? I don't know. I don't remember. No, it was closed. It was closed? I must have closed it. Well, Mrs. Wheel, there's something else I'd like to get straight. Please, I'm very tired. It's awfully late. It's the middle of the night. I'm tired, too, Mrs. Wheel. We're all here at this hour on account of you. All right. What I was going to ask about is this. It's not very clear exactly when your husband got home. What time was it? I told you, 11.30, quarter to 12, and he was drunk, very drunk. You're sure it wasn't earlier? I'm positive. Well, I'm not so positive, Mrs. Wheel. Do you know Mr. Doyle, who lives in your building on the top floor? What's he got to do with it? Mr. Doyle says he was coming down the stairs. He was on his way out for a paper, and he passed your husband going up. Doyle said that was about 10 o'clock. I don't care what Mr. Doyle says. Mr. Doyle says he distinctly remembers the time. He waited until the end of a radio program before he went out for a paper. Oh, you don't care what Mr. Doyle said. Joe didn't get home till 11.30 or quarter to 12. Besides, what difference does it make? I told you I killed him. There's no argument about that, is there? No. I told you I did it, and I told you why I did it. But I can't understand why nobody heard it. Why nobody heard either the fight or the shot. I mean, they're all deaf. Listen, what about my kids? What happens to them? Is somebody going to go up to the fresh air camp after them? Or maybe they'd better stay there. That would probably be best. Probably. Do you have anyone that could take care of them? No, I've got nobody. Nobody at all. What about your mother-in-law? Did somebody tell her? I've got a detective out trying to locate her. Wasn't she home? I don't know. I haven't heard back from the detective. Well, she should be home. Where else could she go? <gasps> Look, what time is it? It's 30 almost. Well, this detective had other things to do. I don't know whether he got to her yet. Oh. This same detective was in a bar and grill down the block from where you live. You know the one I mean? Your husband used to spend a little time in there. I know the one you mean. This detective talked to the bartender. Now, the bartender told him something that checks out, Mr. Doyle, pretty close from the time that your husband got home. The bartender said he remembers your husband left the place about a quarter to ten in the pouring rain, thundering and lightning in the pouring rain. You said he was drunk and nasty, didn't you? He's always drunk and nasty when he comes out of there. Yes, the bartender said something like that, but he said it was quarter to ten. He might have left there at quarter of ten, but he didn't get home till 11.30 or quarter to twelve. But where did he go for two hours? How should I know where he went? He came home and we got in this fight and I didn't ask him. I didn't care. Please, now, I'm tired. I'm tired of asking questions. I've been asking questions almost all night now. I killed him. I told you I killed him. What else is there to it? There's a lot to it, Mrs. Wheels. Why you killed him is very important. I killed him because he was coming after me. Did you love him? I hated him. 
I really hated him, but I didn't kill him because I hated him. I killed him because I was afraid he was going to kill me. Now, oh, Mrs. Wheel, let's be honest, Tom. I'm being honest. The medical examiner said he'd been dead for at least an hour before midnight, probably more. How can he tell oh, that? Oh, we can tell, all right. Even if it was so. And you know it's so. I do not. You know that he came home about 10 o'clock, that you had your fight then, that you killed him then. You know, it was thundering and lightning out. You know, that's apparently why nobody heard the shot. Now, isn't that true? Wasn't it around 10 o'clock that you fired that shotgun at him? Can I, can I smoke? Does anybody have a cigarette? Wasn't it? Yes. I have one of these. Thank you. That's all right. Would you like a light? Yes. Now, why did you tell us that you killed him about midnight when it was really about 10 o'clock? I don't know. Tom's trying to tell you, I guess. As long as I killed him, why should I try to keep it a secret? What did you do between 10 o'clock and nearly 12.30 when he came downstairs and told the officer? I just sat there. I just sat there in the room. I just sat there and thought about the 11 years I've been married to him and kids and the place we live in and being drunk all the time. His mother. I just sat there and thought about it. For two hours, you just sat and thought? No, not all the time. Sometimes I just sat. I didn't think. Were you worried that you killed him or sorry? I wasn't sorry. I wasn't even worried, not at all. I just couldn't think of anything that I could say to his mother. I tried to think of something to tell her, but I couldn't think of a thing, so I just sat there. For over two hours. Your husband's body in the next room. Well, yeah. But the important thing was I couldn't think of anything to tell his mother. I don't wonder. I don't see what there is you could tell her. The interrogation of Mrs. Weald continued. In the meantime, I had been out on patrol of the precinct. At 1 a.m., a fire truck responding to an alarm had collided with a taxi cab on Lexington Avenue and two firemen were slightly injured. I had been out with the battalion chief of the fire department looking over the scene of the accident and assisted him in gathering the information he needed for his report. It was after 4 a.m. when I returned to the station house where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty as I walked around to sign the block. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Sergeant? Hello, Captain. Fred, what's doing? Nothing much, Captain. All right, sir. Oh, did they book that Mrs. Weald on the homicide yet? Okay. No, sir, not yet. Mm -hmm. Well, Lieutenant. Yeah. Coley's on his way into the house with a set of keys left in the ignition of a parked car. Okay. All right, Red. Yes, sir, Captain. All right, Coley. Come on in with the keys. Sergeant. Oh, yes, sir, Captain. Have we got somebody on a fixer tonight over where that upholstery company fire was? Yes, sir. Underwood is on a job there. Oh. To you, if you don't mind. You'll have to make inquiries over here, ma'am. I don't want to make inquiries. I want to talk to him, the captain. Lady, the desk officer will take care of you. The lieutenant. I saw a lieutenant upstairs. He didn't give me any satisfaction. I want to talk to a captain. You're a captain, aren't you? Yes, that's right. And Mrs. Wheels. Mrs. Isabel Wheels. It was my son she shot. She shot him in cold blood. Well, the case is in the hands of the detectives, Mrs. Wheel. I don't care whose hand it's in. That lieutenant upstairs wouldn't give me any satisfaction. So I want to talk to you. What is it you want to talk to me about, Mrs. Wheel? They wouldn't let me talk to her. They wouldn't even let me see her. Well, what's the necessity in seeing her? 21st she Street. killed my Sergeant son, Wheel. didn't she? There's an investigation in progress, Mrs. Wheel. That lieutenant had her up there in that little office upstairs, and he wouldn't even let me go in and talk to her. Well, you can see her in court tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, I'll be busy making funeral arrangements and busy getting those children, my grandchildren, out of that fresh air camp. In cold blood. And he wouldn't even let me give her a piece of my mind. I told him. The first time he brought her home to meet me, I told him he was making a big mistake to think about marrying her. Uh, Mrs. Reed. I could have predicted this. I could have predicted it ten years ago that something like this would happen. Poor children. 
and poor me to raise the boy so that you could shoot him down in cold blood. Look, there's no use talking to me, Mrs. Well, Weir. that detective knocked on my door and told me who it was. I knew something like this had happened. She was out to do this. You can just write that down in your little book. Mm -hmm. Did you tell all this to the detective? Of course I told it to the detective. I told them how he wouldn't go home from work. How he'd come to my house and I'd tell him that she was going to do this. He wouldn't believe me. I'd sit him down and I'd give him a drink and I'd tell him what she was like. I had to keep a bottle of whiskey especially in the house for him. In cold blood. And those poor children. The most gorgeous children you ever saw. He looked just like the grandfather. Uh, Mrs. Weald, it's four o'clock in the morning almost. I'd suggest that you go home and... Here she comes. I want to talk to her. Now, Mrs. Wheel, they're going to book her. You can't talk to her now. I have my right. You don't have a right to talk to her now. I want to book her, Reg. All right. Just stand in there closer to the railing. Yes. That's right. Beyond me, how you can treat anyone like that with decency, that's a human being. The name is Eva Wheel, Lieutenant. W-E-A-L-D? That's right, yes. I wish you would use your maiden name. Mrs. Wheel, if you don't stop interfering, I'll have to ask you to leave the station house. Three one four five first family. With my son, my baby, the baby of my family. That's not interfering. Eight thirty one. You been out for a meal yet, Kent? No, not yet, man. I'd like you to tell the captain why I couldn't see her upstairs. I'd like you to tell him what you told me. Go on, tell him what you told me. It's not necessary for him to tell me, Mrs. Wheel. You have no right to interfere and interview a suspect during the course of the investigation. I'll see what my rights are. Well, you'll be taken to the 19th precinct where they have cells for female prisoners. I don't care. She don't care about anything. And you'll be taken to felony court in the morning. In the meantime, you're entitled to have us make three telephone calls. There's me. nobody I want to call. There's nobody that would talk to her. All right, wait in the back room with her, Tyler. Yes, sir. Right this way, Miss Will. Well, how do you like that? She didn't even have the decency to say hello to me. Not even the decency to do that. After she shot down my son in cold blood. The way she described it, Mrs. Weald, it wasn't exactly cold blood. No? I'd like to know what it was then. Well, that's up to the courts to determine. A lot they know. To kill a woman's son like that. It was the same as if she'd taken that gun and aimed it at me. Just the same. It's a good thing you weren't there, Mrs. Weald. She might have done just that. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Sitting on a ledge where? A man or a woman? Yeah. Yeah. What floor? What floor? Well, if she threatened to jump? Yeah. Yeah. And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan on the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch is Lieutenant King, Harold Stone is Sergeant Waters. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking. 21st Precinct has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. 